There you go, Jordan. It's your show. Okay, we'll get started. So this is going to be a, a, a very different type of workshop than that you know, then we typically do. Usually I like to pick out like one feature and focus on that. And uh, what we're going to do in this workshop is we're actually going to take an existing project that we've built out in the past, and we're going to learn how we can work through some more advanced topics in React. So we're going to take some, uh, some kind of strategies and some, you know, kind of best practices when it comes to writing code in React and in JavaScript so that one, you can kind of see some of the patterns that a lot of, you know, more senior and experienced React developers use, but also there is going to be quite a bit that you'll be able to take from this project and apply to your own. And one of my other goals is I'm hoping that this is going to give you an idea of how some of the more maybe confusing topics or things that maybe you struggled with in the past, how they work, because as we go through some of these more advanced concepts, you're actually going to see some of the inner workings of both React and JavaScript. So uh, right here, uh, as we build this out, the actual functionality in this playlist are, is going to stay pretty much the same. Oh, and can everybody please put your microphones on mute or Mark, if you could mute whoever is playing videos. Um, so the functionality really isn't going to change, but you will see that the code itself is going to change quite a bit. So for anyone that watched this one before, this is a YouTube video playlist where you can have a playlist of all of these YouTube videos and then click on the playlist items and then view them over here in this detail detail uh, kind of view. Uh, I also added a few of these buttons. These buttons are pretty cool buttons that you're going to be able to see how we can take these and uh, actually reuse button components. So we will get started. And for this one, we don't really have to look at anything on the master branch. I'm just going to go straight to the starter branch. And we'll see kind of where we're going to get started. And we're also going to use the README quite a bit. And I extended our objectives to kind of give us some structure. So the very first thing we're going to do is we're going to refactor our playlist render engine, which means these items, each one of these items have a thumbnail that creates a image tag, a title, a status, and uh, you know all of those styles. Right now, this is the identical version to what we did when we built out our playlist. So right now, if you down all the way here in the video playlist component, you'll see that we take our media array, and this is just an array of objects, we iterate over it, and with each iteration, we create a link tag, this little A tag here, where you can click on the item. This is how it knows when we click on one item that we clicked on it versus one of the other ones. We pass in a class name, a key, a thumbnail, and then some of the content. Uh, so the very first thing we're going to do, anytime that you have a iteration where you're mapping over and you're doing some more complex kinds of things, this can usually be a pretty good spot to actually build a function that generates these. And if you wanted to, you could even create a actual dedicated component. But in this case, I want to show you how to do this with just a you know, just a regular function. So I'm going to go outside of the whole component. We could put this in another file if we wanted to, but I'm just going to go outside the whole component and I'm going to create a function here and I'll even export it because the whole reason for doing this, it's not just for code organization. Imagine a scenario where you might have other 
types of components or features in your application that might have a little playlist kind of thing, even if it's not videos, you might have something where you have a thumbnail here, a title and maybe a status and you want to listen for clicks, you can create this function and then you can reuse this throughout the whole application. So I'm going to say export there. const Anything. and then render playlist list item. And this is going to take in some arguments. So it's going to take in some arguments and the way the what we know, because we already built this out, we know exactly what it needs to take in. It needs to take in the item itself. And then we need to have some way to know what to do when it, the item is clicked. And then we also need to know if this is active or not. Uh, yeah, that's where we can put the little plain subtitle down there. So this is just going to take in three different items. And also this goes to a little bit more of an advanced type of concept as well. Uh, notice here, I'm actually saying args, and then I'm going to define the arguments that I want to use. When you use JavaScript functions, you have a few different options. You know, one, I named off those three items. You know, one is the actual item itself, and then the on click, and then is active. I could just list those out here, you know, one after another. Uh, but the problem with doing that is that's not really a scalable way for working with the function, because one thing that you'll notice, uh, the more that you develop and the bigger your applications are, these functions usually need to be extended at some point, like you need to, you know, add in some other property that you want to pass in. When you define a object when you say you know what instead of sending me this specific list of items say pass me an object and then it makes it much easier to work with the data because if you just did the standard kind of list of those arguments then what happens when you need to add another one well, then it can be tricky because then you're going to have to go and update every time you called this function. So here I'm going to say there's going to be these just single object I'm going to pass in. It's going to take in an item of media type. It's going to have a on click handler, which that's just going to be this function type. And then lastly, we're going to say it check if it is active, which is going to be of type Boolean. And then from there, we're going to do a fat arrow function. And so that is our definition. And so now we can literally just copy and paste this entire A tag here. So I can just say, give me that entire A tag. And then I'm going to return that. And we have to do a little bit of cleanup here because we don't have access to all the data that we do in the component. So for the on click, we can just change this to say, I want args on click for this item ID. I want args.item.id for the thumb. I want args.item and then the title, same kind of concept, just following this along. And then actually here, we can just, we don't need to even worry about the video config. And here I can just say args is active. And then that is going to be everything we need. And so now if we come up here, now we can simply say, I want to have this item I want to loop over. And then I just want to call our function, which we have that item, we have the on click, which this is going to be something where we pass in that same thing that we had before, which I think is uh, set video config plain true, and then just pass in, uh, I believe it's just the item. And then is active is going to look, yeah, I think it's going to look actually something like what it is recommending. Let's see what that value is. Oh, active video. So active video is what our item is going to be. And I think, yep, everything else looks good.
So let's hit save. Let's see if that worked. So I'll hit refresh here. Yes, you can see everything's working. Now, when you are building out this type of functionality, one thing uh, that you're going to be doing is you're, the thing you're checking isn't actually for new features. It's actually going to be checking for things like, uh, you know, what you're, uh, you know, just making sure what was already there is still working. And so we have this and, you know, actually our, args on click we don't need that to use a fat arrow function and there we go everything here is still working and we've refactored it into a function now if you go back to our goals we want to talk about using things like the spread operator and then also destructuring uh and so where let me see i have destructuring somewhere here and so for destructuring and the spread operator, notice how when we did this, uh, how I had to type args. And so it's because that's our one argument. It's an, it's an object. But what we can do is we can actually oh. perform something called destructuring. So, well it, oh, and whoever is, make sure everybody is muted. Thank you. So destructuring is something that you may have seen like in documentation or something like that. Uh, and it can look kind of weird or scary or intimidating the first time you see it, but it's really not. All it's doing is it is a way of writing JavaScript code where whenever you're working with an object, you actually can go into that object and you can grab all of those keys and values and turn them into essentially variables. So notice how here, every time we wanted something out of our arguments, we had to say args. What we can do is destructuring allows us to say const and then curly brackets and then the object. In this case, it's args. And so inside of here, we can grab the item, the on click and the is active values and these are now thank god they're doing that this morning I actual not like variables this morning. thank god they're doing this hey albert you're off mute yeah everybody please just look down check and see if you are have your sound on or not turn it off okay so now we can actually do a second refactor here where now we don't even need to call args dot anything so every one of these items we now can get rid of and we can call kind of that root value essentially and so if you hit save and come back you can see everything here is still working perfectly just like uh, just like it was before, but now we have something that is much more scalable and, uh, you know, is much easier to work with. Now, going back to the goals on what we're trying to do, I'm actually going to jump ahead because we're already uh, pretty much doing it on this create function to render all playlist items. So this is something you see where we're calling this function, but it's a little bit long, a little bit messy. If you come back to this a few months after you write the code, it might be kind of tricky to see what's going on here. So any time that you are you know, working and iterating over a collection of data, you can actually build out a function that as long as it only takes in a single argument that you're you know, looping over, you can actually just call that function directly. So we're gonna create another function up here and we're just gonna call this something like, uh, you know, render item. It's gonna take in that item and then I can just paste in what we had inside that map function. And now if you come back down, now we can make this even smaller. So what used to be about, I don't know, 20, 30 lines of code is now literally just a single line of code. So when we're calling media, we're mapping over it. So we're going over each one of the items in the array. And then because each one of those items, the way map works, it simply passes that to 
a function. So before we were getting the value and then we were doing this, you know, render item kind of thing. This is exactly the same code. It's going to do exactly the same thing. It's just a little bit of a cleaner way of writing it. So now we have that entire thing down to one line and come back to the application. It is all still working. So that's a really nice, really clean refactor. And you know, part of the reason why we do this, especially as you start to build out more advanced applications, is because the bigger the application gets, the trickier it is to add new features and to debug problems. Now, notice how we've kind of separated everything out. This is our list. And then here we see how we are rendering a single item. And then from there we can see, okay, this is all the functionality that actually creates that A tag and the thumbnail and those different things like that. So that is, that is something where we've now taken care of two of the big groups of objectives. Now, the next one is really cool. This one uh, is probably the one I'm the most excited about that we're going to be building out. So notice here how we have these buttons and they look completely different, but these are actually an example of what we're going to be doing. Uh, if you look in the code, there is actually this button component. Now, this isn't a div or anything like that. That is a actual button that we have created. So I did this to, I wanted to give you something where you can literally copy and paste a cool button component into your application. Um, and so uh, we're going to build our own uh, kind of base element from scratch. But uh, I definitely recommend for you to look to see what this is okay. doing. This is right. a... I love you button component yeah that's right <laughs> that takes in all of the standard props that any button would so it takes in an on click handler it takes in uh you know pretty much anything that you can pass in to a button you know just like if i were to do something like this if i were to just do a regular button tag just a regular html button you can see what that looks like right here. And so this uses that, but what it allows you to do is extend the functionality. So when you start working on these bigger applications, you're going to notice where you're going to have situations where you want to easily repeat and reshare and reuse uh, these specialized components. So imagine where, you know, you have an application that has hundreds of pages. You don't want to have to recreate and remember all the CSS class names and, you know, all of the custom behavior for every single one of these buttons. That would be a really, you know, annoying way to uh, to build out an application because it, that means that you know say that you have a situation where uh, your boss or your client comes and is like okay we are changing we're no longer going to be using this blue color as our primary color now we're going to be using green or something like that you'd actually have to go all throughout the application and update values of you know everywhere that it uh, that they're being called when we have this button component, we can actually treat this like a normal just run in the mill button, but we can add custom behavior to it. And so I know that is something that if you've never done it before, or, you know, especially uh, if you're early in your development journey, that can be kind of a, a, a confusing thing to think of. So what I wanted to do was to actually create a uh, for us to create our own base component that's similar, but it's not quite as extensive as doing a button. With a button, you have to create all kinds of different uh, edge case scenarios and that kind of thing. Uh, I know guys who work at some of these big companies like Amazon, they're literally their only job is to work on a button. That's all they do. So those can be extensive. So I 
thought it'd be helpful to, you know, create a component you can use uh, that's also very helpful, but won't quite, it's not quite as uh, difficult to build out. And that is a stack element. So right here, notice how we have these two buttons sitting right next to each other. The way that we're accomplishing that is we have a CSS class name called stack row. And then we're adding in a gap value so that they're not pressing up right against each other. This is something that you're gonna have to do and call throughout your entire application. You don't wanna have to remember and manually type this in every time. And then how about scenarios where maybe you want the items to be stacked vertically instead of horizontally, or maybe you want to add some more space between them, what we can do is actually create a component that will do all of that for us. So I'm going to create something here called DOM utils, and we're just going to call this our stack component. And so what we will do is we'll export this stack and this is essentially gonna be a div with some helpful little uh, kind of additional tooling that makes it really easy to you know, create a list of items, uh, whether they be horizontal or vertical. And so the very first thing we need to do, and this part of this has a little bit of TypeScript in it, so I don't want you to you know, get worried about that side of things. So I'm gonna keep it pretty light. Um, so I'm just going to create a interface here that called iProps. And then it's going to extend React, uh, HTML attributes, and then an HTML div component. And so what this means is anytime you're working with React, so any type of component, like our button component here, primary, this value, this is just a prop. It's a property we're passing to the button. You know, you can have other props, you know, that could be something like uh, is submitting, which this one has, and that will show a loader. And so all of the React, uh, you know, big components all have the ability to have props. All we're doing here is we're saying, all of those props that usually divs take in, like, you know, just a normal div, like you use all day long, just a, you know, regular div, all of the div elements take props, like a style prop or a class name or, you know, anything, uh, even an on click. Uh, so the divs take all of those props in, we're gonna say take all those in plus just a, cus a few custom ones. One is going to be spacing, which is going to be a number. Another one's going to be direction. And this is going to be either row or column. And for TypeScript purposes, I'm saying these aren't required. You just, you know, if they are there, then that's great. If not, then we're going to use some defaults. And then inside of our stack prop list, this is where we can set some default values. So I want to say the spacing, that's going to be equal to five, which we're going to convert it to five pixels. Say that you had an application where you wanted your spacing to be 10 pixels, you could set it there. Um, then the style, I'm going to set this equal to just an empty object. Direction, by default, I'm going to say column, because when you're using divs, as you know, when you have a div and you put another div below it, they stack on top of each other. We're going to give the ability for them to be side by side, but we're going to want them by default to be a column and then a class name, which we're not going to set a default for. And then this gets into the next thing. One of our things I was talking about with implementing the spread operator. This is something that you may have seen and looks really weird. But it's very powerful, and we're going to see what this does in a moment. So these are those custom props. And notice here, we have things like style and class name, which we didn't actually type in. And that is because the HTML attributes for a div, those are automatically there by default. We can grab the ones we want and set default values for them. So let's put what we are going to return. We're going to be returning a div. 
And then this is how the spread operator works. You can use curly brackets and then type in rest just like this. And the way this works is imagine that you had, and I think a visual here is a good way of looking at it. So say that you have, you know, some object, it could be anything. And that object could have an ID, it could have yeah, a name, it could have an age, those kinds of things. If I say some object dot ID like this, that's going to give us, you know, the value or give us the ability to set it. Now, say that I only used one of them, but I wanted access to the rest, then I can actually, when I say rest, or, you know, in this case, some object, what that's going to do is it's going to give me all of the other items. So right now we only got ID. It's going to give me name and it's going to give me age. So what we're doing with our new stack component, we do not want to have to manually type in every property that a div takes. Because if you inspect this, you can inspect the div element and <clears throat> actually open it up and look at this. These are all of the props, plus there are even more. These are just kind of the high level ones that a div can take in. That is not something that you want to manually type for every one of those values. So what REST does is it says any other properties, just send the REST directly to the div. And so what the cool thing about that is and what makes us so powerful is that means we're gonna be able to treat our stack exactly like any other type of div. And if you reference that button component earlier, notice here, this only has the three custom properties. But if you go and look at those buttons, this takes all of the other values a regular button takes. So notice it didn't have disabled as one of the props, but that is something that is a prop for buttons. And I can say disabled just like that, or I could pass in any of the area type values and you know pass those in. Um, so that's where this gets really helpful because if you tried, and this is something that you know when you're a new developer, and also when I was learning React, I would do something like this. I would take a component and I would try to get it to do too much. And that made it a component that was really hard to extend and really hard to work with. Here, we're just saying, let the div be treated exactly like normal, but we're just gonna layer on some functionality on top of it. So let's create some values here where we can kind of set our defaults and our overrides. So I'm going to create a, a, let's call it stack class name. And then this is going to take a stack and then whatever the direction value is. And so we, all we need is a little bit of CSS here. And let me find, yep. So this is all that we need to make this work from a CSS perspective. We have a class name called stack row, and we have one called stack column, and it just kind of changes the value of like align items and flex direction. But we are not adding a lot of custom styling in there. So here we're saying the class name is gonna be stack dash, either column or row. So it's going to dynamically inject and create that class name for us just based off of the, uh, yeah, the direction. Now notice we also take in and we're taking that class name because a very common thing to do, as you see with all these divs, is pass in the class name. Well, our stack component also has to be able to do that. So what we can do is in this class name, we can do string interpolation and say, if you have a class name, then show it. So if we put in, you know, some kind of Bottega dash header stack or something, it's going to be added on top. And then we can use custom styling. If not, just do an empty string. 
the only reason that we're you know doing these little bars here is because if you just put in class name what would happen is if it's undefined which means you know you didn't pass it in you'd actually have a class name called undefined so that's why we say either put in the custom one or just have it be an empty string so that is a stack class name and then we're also going to do a stack style so stack style and here i'm going to say and i'll just for some typescript i'm going to say this is going to be react dot css properties it's going to use those values and the reason i like doing that is because that will give me some helpful autocomplete for uh you know as i'm typing these out and make sure i don't have a typo with my css values so i'm going to say if the direction is equal to let's say column then i want to pass in one type of object if they're row i want them to be something else so first thing we're going to use that helpful spread operator again i'm going to say if they're column i want to grab any custom style elements because once again we want to make sure this works exactly like a normal div and if we didn't do this if we if we didn't grab style it would be passed in here and then if someone ever adds custom styles what would happen is our own you know stack styles we are passing in they would get overridden so that's why we're doing that and then all we have to do here is we're just going to say uh if it's column then i want to do something like say that we want to do gap uh, or you know anything that's like column related and we want to do the spacing at this set of pixel values and then this is going to be pretty much identical and here let's say for column we want the spacing to be spacing times two uh, and this is all just to kind of show you how to customize it you don't need to do this unless you really do want them to be twice as big from a spacing perspective and then from there literally all we have to do is pass these into the div so i'm going to have my class name just like normal that's going to be our new generated class name and then our style is going to be our stack style or style prop just like that okay well that that was a decent amount of work and explanation so without actually seeing it work so now let's go and let's go import that so instead of having to do all of this now i'm just going to say i don't want this div anymore i want to use my new stack this is going to be a direction of row and let's do spacing just to test it out just to make sure it's all working a uh, spacing of 20 and hit save and let's see what that does and there you go it is there and we now have that spacing auto injected like that now we can change this up let's say that we want this to be column and now they're stacked on top of each other just like that so with what we have now is like if you ever find yourself and this is kind of the whole purpose of, of this if you ever find yourself in a situation where you're building out an application and you're continually recreating the same type of either layout of or components and class names but then you're having to add custom styles and those kinds of things doing something like this is a very helpful way of doing it and now notice also if i get rid of the defaults and i just call stack just by itself notice here how it does everything perfectly with those defaults this is what it will do if it's just a normal stack and so we have the ability when we want you know to switch these switch the direction switch any custom styles anything like that and also let's say this is a custom one this is going to be like our button group class name and if you now inspect this and go in the inspector here notice we have and i'll zoom in just so you can see this a little easier so it did everything perfectly for us it created stack row created that class name 
And then also it appended that button group, that custom one. So that gives us kind of the best of both worlds. We get all of the default values that we wanted with the styles, but then we also get to add our own class names and literally anything a div can do, this can now also do while also automating our interface. For anybody that is interested in mobile development, this is something that you are really going to want to understand and become familiar with, because if say that you're building with React Native, which is how you can build mobile applications with React, React Native doesn't even have a concept of divs. What all React Native has is the concept of these type of components. They have, for anyone that's never seen it before, they have a view component, which is almost kind of like a mobile div. And then they have a text component just like this. You do not see any divs, spans, anything like that. All that you have are these kind of custom components. And that's how you build React Native applications. So I, in some of my more advanced applications, even web ones, you would look at the code and you you might wonder what in the world's going on because the majority of the components are not even using divs or spans or heading tags because the bigger the application gets, the more that I you know build out these type of custom base components because they help automate everything. I don't have to remember class names anymore. I don't have to use, you know, reuse the same default styles uh, when I'm building it. So that is something you will see in a lot of more advanced applications. So that is there and we're almost done. We just have uh, one more thing because uh, this is the uh, button and stack component creation. And the next one is air handling. And this is one because Everybody knows that part of being a developer is dealing with uh, bugs and things like that. So what happens if, say that your system is not hard-coded, because it usually is not going to be. Say that you're getting playlist data, and some of the data has missing values. So right now, I'm just going to copy this one and... I'm going to, for the sake of this example, go down to our render engine. Say that you wanted all the titles to be capitalized. So I'm gonna say to uppercase. And then you come right here, everything works. Now, what happens if you get data without a title? The title's empty, very common the whole thing breaks. You have no way of, and you know, you have no data, anything like that. So what is the problem? Well, the problem is that you tried to call to uppercase on the title. And so that is going to be something that, uh, you know, you want to kind of watch out for. There's a couple ways of doing it. One is also in the readme is to use something called optional chaining. So here, what we can say is item dot title question mark dot. And so what that's going to do is it's going to say, if there is a title, then call this method. If not, then just leave it empty. So if I hit save now, you can see everything's working. It doesn't have a title, but we didn't break the entire application. So that's how you can use, utilize optional chaining to, uh, you know, to mitigate some errors and that kind of thing. We could also even do something because like imagine you have a situation where all the values are blank. You just got blanks on all of these, then that's gonna be something kind of messy. You just have this whole thing here that is empty. Well, what we can do there is in our media iterator, we can say media dot question mark filter, and then we can grab each one of those items and we say only if I dot ID, or you could check for you know whatever values, and then another question mark, and then 
notice it immediately filters out any of the bad data. And so even if the API sends you some stuff that couldn't get rendered, the system just completely ignores it and bypasses it. And so now we've been able to, one, any type of value that maybe had a function call on it, we get to make sure it misses those. And then for any of them where you know no data is there at all, we get to filter and skip over all of that. So that is something you're going to be implementing the longer and the more advanced your applications get, you're going to be implementing those kinds of things quite often. And what this does is it lets you in one line create this title where before you might have to do something like this, where you create like an empty variable and say, if item.title, then set the title equal to item.title uppercase. And you know, here we're able to streamline all of that and do it all just in one line. So that is it. We have a full application that has air handling, uses shared components that can be used across the entire application or even other projects. And we're able to see some of those more advanced concepts. So um, let, uh, so we still have just a little bit of time. Uh, if anybody has any questions at all, please type them into the chat and I can answer them as best as I can. No, I don't think I could. Uh, I don't think I could hack his computer, even from a, even if take out the ethical side of it. That is not my specialty. I did allow them to un, un, unmute it so they can unmute themselves. <laughs> now. Yep, yep. No, you're all. Yeah, you're all good. But, um... Is there a YouTube video you'd recommend to learn TypeScript? Um, I mean, there are some. I, I uh, we have TypeScript in uh, in Dev Camp that you can. Uh, uh, you, I think you should be able to either find it in the library or ask your mentor for that. Um, the the actual documentation on TypeScript from Microsoft is very good. So uh, TypeScript, you just go to typescriptlang.org. I'll paste that into the chat. Uh, this is a really good way of uh, kind of because you can like run code uh, in there and uh, you know you can see some of the examples and uh, so this is very helpful. Notice how like a lot of these things are like exactly what we were typing in, you know, where we could create types and interfaces and those kinds of things. Um, but yeah, we have it in DevCamp. And then also, if you go into the, um, uh, if you go into the mobile application when you're done with React, then the whole that whole thing is built in TypeScript as well. Um, so yeah, that, that's really good. There's another one. Um, uh, let's see. Yes. So here we go. Yeah. So it's on the same site, typescriptlang.org. They have ones that are specific for React. And so it has some of the frameworks, but, you know, even looking at like some of the things like the uh, cheat sheets here, they have... You know, some really helpful kind of things that you can go through and um, some helpful ones. Uh, I know that 
uh, TypeScript can look a little intimidating. The thing I will say about it that's really nice, once you learn just a couple core concepts, that's really what you're going to be using for 99% of the work you're doing. So like take, for example, this media type here. And what we're all we're doing is we're just describing the types of data that we're working with. So here you can see we have this data value and inside of here as an ID, a title and description. And so when we're creating this, we're just saying, okay, this has a title, as ID. In this case, we're, we did some pre-processing to get it to map to this. But all, it, uh, all TypeScript really is doing is it's JavaScripts. It, it, at the end of the day, it's just JavaScript code with the ability to just define how the data is structured. So to say, okay, for our video config, instead of wondering, you know, what's inside a video config, you know, plain being a Boolean and active video being a midi media type, we just get to wrap it up and say, you know what, anytime we're working with a video config, these are the values inside of that object and these are those types. And the nice thing about that is like plain, uh, you know, this tells you if this is going to be a Boolean, if I were to type plain and say, you know, nope, not playing well i get this helpful little error message where it says string is not assignable to boolean and so it more than anything it is it gives you the ability to define how your data looks but technically you could actually write an entire typescript application in a hundred percent vanilla javascript so like say right here for render playlist item I could say args, just like regular JavaScript, it's giving me a little warning because it wants to have a type, but I could say args any, and everything still works exactly the same. So at the end of the day, it is still just JavaScript, and then you get to pick how much of TypeScript you want to use. So you get to say, if you want to define those values and that kind of thing. Um, let's see. Uh, oh, thank you, Alex. Um, is Brilliant, uh, I'm not sure. I, I haven't actually ever heard of Brilliant, so I don't know on that. Um, can you use an API to do the TypeScript? Um, well, I mean, at the end of the day, uh, you don't really need API or anything. It's it's just it's just JavaScript code with types on it. So I guess the answer to that would be yes. Uh, you know, anything that you can do in JavaScript, you can do in TypeScript. You just uh, get to add the way the data is going to look and that kind of thing. Um, and let's see, Ron, how long have I been coding? Uh, about, let's see, I'm 39, started my... Oh, so 22 years now. So it's been a while. Uh, Cornelius, uh, is there a website or app that offers practical application to help learn um, TypeScript? Uh, I mean, the, the TypeScript lang one I sent, that one is the one I recommend the most, mainly because it has a very helpful playground that lets you, you know, follow the guides and you actually get to type the TypeScript directly into their playground and see if what you typed is, you know, valid TypeScript code and that kind of thing. There also are plenty of like TypeScript uh, starter applications that you can use and, you know, follow along with that kind of give a good starting point. Um, and let's see, Chris, what's the hardest, what's the hardest to learn so far? Um, I mean, everything is hard to learn, at least for me. Everything takes me a long time to learn. Um, I would say, uh, I would say React Native and a lot of the mobile development with React Native is really tricky. Um, that 
that's pretty, that's definitely very challenging because, uh, it, you know, you, one, like I was mentioning, you have to get outside of the mindset of being able to use divs and heading tags and those things. So you have to kind of almost like reframe how you do your coding. Um, and so that's a big thing. Then also you have, you know, to worry about memory management and a lot of things you don't have to worry about with web applications as much. So, um, so I, I would, out of everything I've done so far, I would say that uh, mobile development is probably one of the more challenging. Um, let's see, Andrea, when I'm programming, what's your preferred language, Python, JavaScript, React? Uh, I would probably lean towards, uh, you know, like, React and uh, JavaScript and TypeScript. Uh, I do them so much. So that's, um, you know, that's probably what I prefer. At the end of the day, you, when I think of programming, it's all about the uh, the right tool for the right job. So, you know, Python is amazing at uh, backend development, server applications, APIs, those kinds of things, uh, machine learning. Um, so, for that, you know, when that's what you need to do is build those type applications, then, you know, I prefer Python. When it's front end or mobile development, then, you know, that's where I lean towards JavaScript and React. Let's see, Alex, what's the, uh, oh, uh, Alex P said, are you going to update DevCamp? And yes, I, we, we update, we actually update the curriculum on DevCamp uh, almost on a daily basis. Uh, we have now, I think, 1,500 guides and lessons across the board. So yeah, we update it regularly. Uh, we're all, we also, this in next, the, in 2023, we have a lot of really exciting new courses and things like that. Uh, Alec asking, what's the topic of the next dev talk? I haven't, I haven't finalized it yet. I actually, I actually take a lot of time building out these projects. And so, uh, what I like to do just to give you some idea of how it works in my mind, uh, I like to find some big feature or something like that, that I have built in the past month, whether it's for dev camp or, you know, anything like that, uh, usually something non-trivial. So you can have something more advanced that you can't get, you know, in very many other places. And so I kind of keep a running log as I'm developing each day of features I think could be interesting. So I have a list that's probably about a hundred features long or so running that, um, and so I'll, I'm going to start now that this one's done, I'm going to, you know, go on to the next one and then build that project out. Uh, let's see. Uh, Austin saying at a higher level, what I re recommend uh, we avoid doing React. Um, I mean, there are a lot of anti-patterns in React, you know, a lot of things you want to avoid. Uh, you know, a, a big one would be, uh, you know, we actually have something we're doing it right here, but um, say that you have a component like this and you're using React hooks, a thing that you want to avoid, and this is the same for class components, is if you are saving an updating state in a component, whether it be a hook component or a class one, at the end of the day, they're the same thing. Um, you want to make sure that you're always resetting the component at when you're done. So in this case, you see, we only have this video config here. And what this hook does, this is the same thing as in uh, like with class components, uh, you know, when you know, say what to do when the component is unmounted, um, that we want to make sure that we're resetting it. So I, that's one common thing I've seen that a lot of people do and not uh, realize it is they forget to reset it. 
And like, say you did that for a form and you forget to reset some of the data that got changed. I've had times where I forgot to do that. And then the next time you open up that form, it might have some of the data from the last time that it was opened, which means like, say that you're building out some kind of blog or something like that, and you had a category or tags, the next time you open it, if you didn't clear those out, it might pull in those values from the previous one. So making sure that you're clearing that out is always something that you wanna do. Um, let's see. You guys have some a lot of really good questions today. Thank you for that. Those are really good. Um, yep, Mark addressed the one to Mr. Decker. Yes, they're, they are monthly. And uh, they're, they're on the first Wednesday of every month. And if you follow Bottega's um, uh, Instagram or social accounts, they always post that. Um, let's see. And... Uh, to Sean, yeah, you can t you can ask the question. You can type it in here. And Chris, do I own DevCamp? Is that my thing? I I, I was the original developer. I, I founded DevCamp, and then uh, DevCamp merged with Bottega. And so yeah, I still head up DevCamp. Uh, Ryan S. Asked, I'm considering starting some C sharp studies for ASP.NET. What are your thoughts on it? Uh, yeah, I mean, C sharp's great. It's one of the older you know, language MVC uh, compiled languages out there. So, I mean, it's a great one. It's not one I have a ton of experience with. I've been on a few C sharp projects. Um, it's very, very different. The whole coding ecosystem, the environment setup, everything is very, very different. Um, but it's great. And also, a lot of things in TypeScript are actually kind of taken from C Sharp because Microsoft kind of manages both of those. Let's so see. yeah, Jordan. Uh... Uh, this is to Sean again. Yeah. So basically, my uh, my question for you was uh, so now I guess it's twofold actually. So uh, I see that you in some of your, I don't know if it's still relevant, but in some of your stuff, you uh, in some of your courses you do uh, Ruby Ruby on Rails, mm -hmm. um, which I have a little bit of experience with, but um, I mainly have uh, experience with Python mm -hmm. and just. Um, Wondering what where the thought process was in including Ruby instead of like uh, Django, and now after seeing because I, I I honestly don't know anything about React, so now after seeing React, do you think that it's better to do all front end activities through JS React instead of uh, trying to implement something like Django or Rails? Uh, I mean. Uh, it kind of goes back to the what I said earlier on like the right tool for the right job. So uh, Django, Ruby on Rails, uh, well, and to give you a practical example, uh, DevCamp is a giant Ruby on Rails application, uh, including the front end. So there are some, uh, there are some embedded React components inside of uh, DevCamp, but for it, it is actually a MVC traditional Ruby on Rails application, which is, it's almost the exact same thing as Django. So like Django and Rails are, are very, very similar. Um, React was not up, it wasn't built out when, we originally built DevCamp, so it was it wouldn't have been the right tool for the right job at that point. Um, so uh, that's a reason why that was all built in Ruby on Rails. Um, and so uh, I, the way I do it now with pretty much all of my applications is I have the back end in either Ruby or uh, which uses Rails for the framework or Python. And a lot of times I'll use Django or, you know, something else for the, uh, but I mainly have it function as an API. Uh, you could still build those applications and they're still great applications. There's still millions of them um, 
for, uh, you know, that have those uh, frameworks doing everything and those are great. Um, but yeah, it's, to me, it kind of depends on your expertise level on those. So I have seen absolutely horrible applications that were built out that, you know, use React as a front end and, you know, something else in the back end and they like followed the, you know, what seemed like a good pattern, but it was clear the developer didn't know how to, you know, maybe didn't know React very well or something like that. And I've seen incredible applications that were built, you know, using just only Django or, you know, only a Ruby on Rails or, you know, something like that. So uh, a lot of it comes down to, you know, how comfortable you are in those. Um, but uh, all of them now have been built out to the point where you can do some really amazing things with them. Awesome. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Um, JP and Austin, you, you both asked what, uh, thoughts on Next.js and then 3.js. Uh, 3.js, I, I played around with a little bit. I don't have a lot of uh, expertise on it. It looks really cool though. Uh, for Next.js, I love Next.js. I don't use it because I feel like it's a little bit opinionated, um, you know, where uh, you kind of have to follow their patterns. And I personally prefer having more freedom and flexibility with uh, with the applications I build out. Um, uh, but, and we don't teach Next.js mainly because uh, Next.js follows a very standardized structure with the code base. And that is, uh, if we taught a framework like that, then we'd be doing a disservice to you as students because you know, you'd go out and you'd you know, be trying to get a job at a place. And unless that place also use Next.js, then you'd be in trouble. So you'd be kind of really like limited on the projects that uh, you'd have expertise in. So I have seen, you know, like if you become very good at learning React, you can learn Next.js in a weekend. Uh, if you can become very good at just Next.js, it's going to take a lot longer uh, if you go to a place that doesn't use it. So Jordan, I know yep. we're at the top of the hour. Yes, but you yes, have a few are. more questions. You want to yep. tackle uh, those? Yep. Let me scan. He has Chris's. Right. Yep. Chris uh, wants to know if JavaScript is the future and the past and everything. <laughs> yeah. I'm, um, yep. I know I'm paraphrasing you, Chris, but yep. it's, a, it's a good question. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, JavaScript definitely is the, uh, you know, the language that is, you know, probably the most popular one in the world. Uh, it, especially if you're a new developer, it's very important to realize why that is though, because uh, I, I don't personally look at, I don't really compare languages. I don't think one language is really better than the other in general, especially for the really popular ones. Um, uh, so, it's the same thing I've said now a few times. It's all the right tool for the job. The reason why JavaScript has become so powerful is because and so popular is because JavaScript is the only real language that browsers know how to run. So that means that you are able to write code that the browser itself is able to process. Uh, browsers can't process Python, Ruby, C Sharp. It, they can't process any of those languages. So if you want actual functionality happening in the browser, then JavaScript's the real only choice for that. And now, because we've you know kind of gotten to this point where you need to be able to you know, build in functionality that's dynamic, like where you need, you know, something on a page, if they click on it to, you know, immediately show a different form field or, you know, something like that. JavaScript's really the only one that can do it. That's why at the end of the day, why it's so uh, powerful and popular, because uh, you can't do that with other languages, even Django, Ruby on Rails, which are frameworks technically, uh, they they can kind of mimic that, but they can't actually 
speak to the browser, they have to have you know a layer in between. And like even Ruby on Rails, which I have uh, probably the most experience with, uh, the, uh, even with that one, as they've evolved the framework, they have a huge layer of JavaScript inside of the framework to be able to have that type of uh, really reactive and dynamic behavior. And um, let's see. Got two more, I think. Yep. Okay. As someone who has no experience, which path would I be better off following getting certificates? There's so What's as that? you read that it was a, yep. there have been actually a lot of new people who join who awesome started on monday so uh oh cool welcome cool. this is their first dev talk oh yeah um, so that that's a good thing good to see you all absolutely yeah doyle is a good question as someone who has no experience which path would it be better off following getting the certification than looking for a career or getting a job before searching uh i mean that one a lot of that uh you know, is really kind of up to you and the type of companies that you're wanting to work with. But uh, over the past 15, 20 years, it, you know, used to be where you're, you needed a degree to get a job uh, in, uh, in the development field. That is nowhere near the case anymore. I would say the majority of our, you know, graduates who have gotten hired uh, do not have a degree. So uh, it's definitely not required. You have very popular uh, companies like, you know, Tesla, Twitter, uh, Google, uh, they do not have a requirement of a degree. Um, so it's not required. It, uh, there are some you know, kind of more old school companies where, you know, that's just a degree, something that they have on their checklist and it's required. And if you, you know, you want to work for one of them, then that's something that you need. But uh, it's definitely not needed from an expertise perspective. Uh, some of the most talented, uh, successful developers I know do, don't have a degree. Uh, you know, they're self-taught or they went through code schools and, um and they are making a ton of money working at uh, you know big companies, so um, it, it's definitely not required. Um, it, it's up to one you, and then also the type of companies you're looking for. Um, and then lastly, Ron, how does coding tie in the game industry? Uh, the game industry is so massive, uh, coding is required at every single level. So for gaming, uh, you know, it depends on what part of the gaming industry that you're wanting to go in. You have mobile, you have, uh, you know, metaverse stuff, you have, uh, you know, console games, and each one of them have their own languages and frameworks and that kind of thing. So uh, if you have no experience in development, you're just getting into it with the end goal being, um, you know, getting into the gaming industry. One of the big things, one of the first things you need to do is simply, you know, uh, figure out or learn core concepts with programming because you're going to need that period. And it doesn't matter what language or framework or anything like that, you're going to need to have that kind of knowledge just period. Um, and so then it's you know, once you have that, then you can start to refine it and start being like, okay, I this is the part of the gaming industry I'm really the most interested in. And then you can start to kind of specialize in that and uh you know learn some of the you know other languages and frameworks they use uh and uh kind of start to approach it that way uh, i will say the first you know one to two languages that you learn are going to be by far the hardest but after you've established that and you've you know, actually got a hold of just how programming works just in general it's going to make everything so much easier you know you'll pick up your uh fifth language 10 times faster than you picked up your first and second so uh that uh, that would be my kind of advice to that yeah thank you everybody for so, your questions today I, I appreciate it thank you jordan this was a a, a very large did meet with 65 people on the call and awesome that's pretty impressive absolutely uh,
good to see you all engaged. And uh, again, thank you, Jordan. You all have a good evening. You too. Talk with you soon.